Production funding for Making It Up North is provided by the citizens of Minnesota through the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Everybody wants to be good at something. In fact, we want to be great at it. But what does it take? This time we'll explore learning the craft with a basket weaver in Grand Marais, a Duluth paddle maker, a craft brewer in Grand Rapids, and the head chef at Sarah's table. Step inside, let's see what it takes. We're in the kitchen with Jillian Forte, Chef Jillian Forte at Sarah's table. Thank you for letting us come over. Yeah, I'm glad you could come. So what are we making today? We're going to make a sofrito. So lots of people know uh, the French mirepoix, but this is kind of a Latin American. French mirepoix, you use carrots, celery, and onions. In the Latin American one, they use onions, garlic, and we're going to make a Cuban one today by some of my heritage, and we're going to use a green pepper. This is the one that my grandma taught me, and this is the one I want to do today. Excellent. So how tricky? Not tricky. This one's really easy. So the first thing we're going to do is cut our onion. You can dice it small. depends on if you have a blender or not. We have a really nice one, so I don't have to do anything super crazy. But there's a nice dice. And I was teasing you about knife skills. Mm -hmm. Where did those come from? Practice. <laughs> and not wanting to cut my fingers anymore, so I, I practiced and practiced. Um, green pepper, this is my best tip for green peppers. Everyone cuts green peppers right down the center, cuts that seed pod in the center and sprays seeds everywhere. So a great trick that I learned is to follow that pith around the side, and you can get all of the green pepper right down like that. Wow. And you don't disturb the seed pod at all. Yeah. Wow. It's much, much better. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So then I'm just going to give this a rough chop. So who taught you to do this? Um, boy, you know, I think the first person I saw really working in a kitchen was my grandma. Um, and she taught me, she taught me this recipe. And she uses this in all kinds of things. It's the base for her congri, which is her rice and beans, for her picadillo, which is a beef-based dish. When you get to the uh, actual recipe, you can't tell what the flavor base is because you can't see it. You just can sense that aromatic feeling and, and it's, it's kind of like the secret ingredient because you can't see it. But it's really not that secret. But <laughs> well, it's less secret now. Anyway. Yes. But what a wonderful way to add flavor. Yeah, and it's very simple. So we're just going to pop that in there. And so after we have it fully blended, it just looks like this, this blended thing. When you think about this, do you think about your grandmother? Do you think about those hands that taught you? I do. So I have a sofrito on the menu right now that I use red peppers. I actually use a piquillo pepper, and I use tomatoes. And then I add a chicken stock to it, and saffron, and shrimp shells. So it's a little bit of that base, the same base as this, but I've layered a bunch of different things on top of it. So when I did create that recipe, I was thinking about my grandma. She was like the base layer, you know? It's like the base of my learning is the base of my recipe, and I build up from there. Fantastic, thanks yeah. for showing us your tricks. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of the first questions I, I get, can I put it in the water? And every paddle is made to be put in the water. And my, my hope is that it's both form and function, but the emphasis is probably on function. 
it certainly doesn't hurt that it's beautiful as well. Um, just aesthetically appealing and uh, incredibly functional. I spent years as a whitewater rafting guide, and so I can be a little aggressive with my paddling. Um, and uh, part of the draw of this paddle is that I knew it would hold up because it's so well crafted. My name is Josh Rood. I am a paddle maker and furniture maker for Glow Rood Design. And I'm here in Duluth at the Duluth Folk School. I guess the beginning point of learning this was my engagement gift to my wife was a paddle. And eight years later, I decided like, I better, I wanna make good on this. I had some time on my hands. It didn't get finished. It was, uh, it needed to be put away because it was not going anywhere good. Part of the learning for me was uh, a couple of friends that had worked for a paddle company that was here in Duluth. Uh, and along the way, they had given me some, some advice on how to better that first paddle I made. I got this book on paddle making and uh, some of these shapes aren't typically ones that you can find anymore. And so it was something that was new and I grabbed onto it and ran with it. It's not anything wild, but it allows me, or at least I took a, a step at putting some, a little bit different touches on it. This design was one that I had made and my wife uh, liked that style. And so this one was, uh, the first one was given to her um, as the one that she has kind of chosen. I had been making a number of paddles and people, some people have, seen them and bought them and then they had said you should really go to one of the shops in town and and see if they'll sell them and so i went to frost river and i had driven in and parked in the in their uh, parking lot and sat in the car for at least 10 minutes contemplating whether i was going to do this and then got out with my paddle and was walking towards and the shop and i actually walked back and sat back in the car for a bit and finally said I just gotta just gotta go in and went in and asked if they'd be interested in displaying my paddles and having them for sale and and he said sure that'd be great this is the Norwegian letter Ur with the, the line through it is a paddle our family name in Norway was Glorud and uh, took that name and put it to the paddles. When you grow up in Minnesota or spend a lot of time on the water, um, you can't explain to people, but there's something about boats and paddles and water that's in your blood. And uh, so it's great that Josh is sort of part of this, this tradition of, of uh, craftsmen who's, who's honoring you know, all these people who came to Minnesota for the love of water. brought our kids in for the first, their first Bounty Waters trip. I think that's probably uh, the most fulfilling piece for me is to have something that I made in my hands uh, as we move across the water. Well, let's talk about learning the craft and in, in particular your culinary skills. How did you like perfect what you're doing? Practice, practice, practice. Um, I've been cooking for about 20 years professionally. Granted, some of that time was dishwashing and chopping mounds of vegetables, um, practicing my knife skills, and then gradually learning new things, watching coworkers, watching chefs that I was with, watching my grandma, um, reading lots of cookbooks and magazines. There is a visual piece to, to the process as yeah. well as to the presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think 
when I'm thinking about food, I'm thinking about colors. And you know, we always say in the business, the first thing that you eat with is your eyes. So your food has to be beautiful. The second thing is your nose, so it has to smell good. Um, and then the third thing that you eat with is your mouth and your palate. Um, so it's hard to think about that sometimes, but it's true that those little zigzags on the plate make you go, wow, and, and your expectation for the dish is gonna be a little bit higher than if it's slop on a plate. Best way to learn the craft? Practice. Practice, I, I also think don't be afraid to try things. Try new flavor profiles. Um, if there's a spice that I have that I've never experienced before, I am not afraid to just taste it and see what that tastes like and try, like I'll, I'll oftentimes take little bits of spices and putting them on my cutting board and I'm tasting this and tasting that and oh, you know, maybe that would be really good with yogurt or maybe that would be really good with this and um, yeah, I try. So lots of experimenting, it's definitely some fails. <laughs> And what do you do with the fails? Those times where, like, I thought this was going to be fabulous. Yes, you know? I've had those. Um, I feed it to my family. <laughs> so this didn't really work out so great. Um, compost bin. You know, I, I think for me, composting doesn't make me feel, I, I don't feel as guilty when I compost things. Like, okay, at least it's going back to the earth. This will contribute to society in some way. Uh, but you're not discouraged by it from experimenting the next time? No, I think it's any time you have a fail, you kind of, I kind of pout for a little bit, like, hmm, I thought I was gonna get that, I thought I was gonna nail it, but okay, take a deep breath and let's try something else. So that happens. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. I can't wait to try more. Yeah. <laughs>
kind of how to scale up uh, recipes has been challenging. A uh, bit of trial and error of just kind of what I what I think some beers were going to be and what they actually turned out to be. At this point, we're eight eight weeks in <laughs> of actually being operating and open, <laughs> and um, you know brewing is pretty second nature to me at this point. I was brewing commercially for the last three years and home brewing for what, another three three years before that. Yep. Three four years before that, and so the, the process and the brewing, it's like all right. I just when I get started, I know exactly what to expect for the rest of the day, and you know filing taxes and managing QuickBooks and making sure I'm ordering my grain and keeping up on crawler supply and all the things that just kind of yep. at this point are kind of random. <laughs> that it's like it's hard not to forget things. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is day two of a double double brew, and our first beer is starting to ferment. If you want to see, it's a, always a good sign when, when you know that yeast is alive and active, and it's turning uh, the wort we made yesterday into beer. I was afforded a great opportunity at Hammerheart to to learn how how to brew and how to you know, use, uh, you know, commercial equipment. And we're pretty happy to afford the same uh, information to Max and show him the ropes. I'm really <laughs> appreciative of it too. Yeah. <laughs> Cause for a long time, I wanted to start my own brewery someday once I had some knowledge, but I never had that for hand on experience. So I'm lucky to get this job here. So I'm happy. Just double check that we're all stirred up. All right. Mm. I think we got a good mash going here. I guess we're kind of a small scale production brewery um, with the idea of, you know, most, most of our beers to be sold in the tap room. Well, beer is our first business, obviously, so Andy does an amazing job with his beers and, you know, never kind of wavering on, on the quality of the beer. But I also really envisioned like a community space. So when you walk in, you're like, yeah, I can, I can hang out here for a while. Traveling Jack's like my uh, kind of, I guess, it's gonna be my house IPA from what I'm seeing and what people like, but I wanna keep tweaking it a little bit every time and just see if there's a version I like better. Try not to experiment too much per recipe, but enough to learn something. We're only, like Andy said, eight weeks in, but we feel really, um, really supported and we feel a lot of love from the community and our family and friends seeing people in the tap room that's absolutely incredible <laughs> just uh, feels feels like we made it already we are very lucky and very humbled <laughs> by the response that we've had so yeah it's mushroom season it's hard for me to turn my mushrooming eyes off because I'm just constantly scanning I feel most at home in the woods uh, and like we've been looking for mushrooms, I'm always looking for what else is in season right now. Bingo, lobster mushrooms. So you can just barely see them off the trail, but they're back here. So these are two birch trees that were harvested three years ago. Um, got a permit here from the DNR. Um, and the better bark is up high. I get it in the summertime when the wild roses are in bloom. Sap's running three weeks. I got three weeks to a month to get all the bark I need for the whole year. It's such a sensational time because of the feeling of the bark and it's wet and the sound of it popping off and the taste of the sap, it's, it's, yeah, that's my favorite part of the basket weaving. My name is Beth Homa Kraus, and I'm known as Birchbark Beth uh, because I am a birchbark basket weaver working and living out of Grand Marais, Minnesota. It's kind of like pages of a book. There's many, many sheets, and every year it will grow another layer of bark but grows on the inside layer. I will have a project in mind 
but the trees definitely tell me what kind of project I'm going to make because um, they'll split in a way that I can control the split somewhat, but they'll split how they want to split too. And I'll have different piles of different thicknesses of weavers, different lengths of weavers. And so usually I'll start with like, I want to make a backpack or I have an order for a briefcase or something like that, usually a bigger thing. And through making a bigger uh, project, I'll have all these other piles for smaller projects. And then I usually will make them all at the same time. I feel like there's like an energy in the bark that the tree spent its whole life growing. And you can feel that energy in the tree and in the cube or in the basket. And it kind of has like this like life of its own. I've always been an artist, uh, drawing, making things. My dad had a workshop and we'd make toys. Um, I would just like hammer nails into wood and then paint it and do some weird like imaginative toys. I was always interested in making boats. I went to North House to build boats. I built a cedar strip canoe, a Susan skiff, decked hand on the Yordas. And while I was there, I took a birch bark basket class. Uh, kind of begrudgingly, I didn't really want to do a basket class. I didn't think baskets were cool. But when I stopped and I finished, I, it was like something clicked. And I tell people I got weaver fever and I couldn't stop weaving. It just became an obsession. You know, I started my basket journey at North House um, as an intern, and then uh, I taught here. We see building future craft instructors and future master crafts men and women as part of our mission. We can't teach traditional Northern craft if we don't build the teachers. And that's what the Artisan Development Program is really trying to do. They called me last spring, or this spring, uh, and said, we got this program we're going to try to start called the Artisan Development Program. The program really functions as an incubator where they get to work on their craft, work on learning more about teaching, and be able to really focus on what they're doing. So I asked my fiance, like, I'm going to have to move up to Grand Marais and do this. Should I do this? And we both were like, well, we'd regret, I'd, I'd regret it if I didn't. What we're hoping that the program offers Beth is a chance to try new directions, to experiment with different materials, and to really build a body of work. So she's not producing the same form over and over because that's what sells best at the next show on the calendar. I looked at all the masters and my mentors and asked them, you know, like, how long have you been weaving and how did you get so good? And I said, you know, you just got to keep doing it. And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm almost 30, and if I don't dive into this now, when am I? And I need to start accumulating these years of experience. So I left my job and just full time went into basketry. And it was scary. Uh, and every couple of months I think, what am I doing, basket weaving? Is that a job? But it is. It doesn't necessarily get easier. Uh, your family will have doubts. Your friends will question what you're doing. And you yourself will be like, wouldn't life be easier if I just had a normal job? But I don't think I'd be happy with a normal job. Beyond food, you're responsible for a whole lot more. A whole lot more. How has that education piece been? Sometimes it feels like parenting. Sometimes, yeah, it's different. And I have a different leadership style than I think most male chefs run their kitchens. So I tend to not be a powered down kind of person. I'm more of an empowering type of person. 
I like to set clear expectations and let people know when they are not meeting those expectations. It shows, I think, in your food. Yeah, yeah, I, that's my goal is so that each cook that's here feels some personal responsibility and pride in what it is that they're doing and um, I trust them and they know that and so I think that feels good for everybody. Do you feel like you're developing the next generation of, of chefs or I, do you see that happening? Yes, I do. There's, you know, the, the, the entry into a kitchen, of course, is the dish pit. And so I'm hiring kids in there in college and the ones that are really good at it, I just think you don't belong there. And if they show an aptitude and a thoughtfulness, then I can bring them into the kitchen and start training basic knife skills and basic sauteing and and things like that. So that's really fun to do, I think. And I think everyone should learn how to do that because everyone's going to eat three meals a day for the rest of your life from now until you die. So I always think it's good to show people those things, yeah. Thinking about learning the craft, food is a good craft to learn. Yeah, I think everybody should know how to cook. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate you taking yeah. the time. This is really fun. Yeah.